Hi everybody. Oh, the cat's here too. Everybody's here. <laughs> Sam is over there. He is here and the cat is right there. Um, welcome to episode nine of Booze and Art. Um, today I will be uh, talking about refined gin and my painting uh, called Mundus Est Fabula, The World is a Story. Um, so I want to start with Refined Gin. Um, this is an amazing local California um, distillery. Um, it is located down in Paso Robles. Um, and Refined is pretty cool because they are also a uh, winery. And um, they uh, make all of their distilled products, well, except for their whiskeys, but they make all of their clear spirits from the... Um, basically like the spent grapes from making wine. Because once you press um, the grapes and get rid of it, there's all this juice and all this mush and all this other stuff that's actually already, you know, fermented or has been fermented. So they re, uh, reuse that. And instead of dumping it down the drain, essentially, um, they uh, distill it into uh, their spirits. So um, it's pretty cool because a lot of the other wineries in the area also um, just give them that uh, grape uh, mush and um, it becomes absolutely a delicious spirit. So they make a vodka, um, a cucumber vodka, which is the best cucumber vodka I've ever had, um, the gin and a limoncello, which is really good too. Um, and the gin is super delicious. Um, so those grapes are uh, Rhone varietal grapes. Um, so that's what it's distilled from. It's 100% grapes, um, and it's super delicious, and they have a uh, wonderful tasting room I haven't been to yet. <laughs> I keep trying, <laughs> and one of these days I'll actually get there, but, um, ah, so the grapes give the gin a really silky, velvety sort of, uh, character, and, um, and... Hi, everybody who's just joining. <laughs> um, it's a really lovely, silky character to it that... You can definitely get just on the nose, but it's especially like prevalent when uh, you take a sip of it. So I was gonna make a little cocktail. Um, and uh, so I'm gonna take two, uh, two ounces. So that's one ounce and another ounce of the gin. And then I'm gonna use the limoncello. So limoncello is actually a um, mm, Italian liqueur made from um, lemon peels uh, soaked in spirits ah! with sugar added to it. Um, and if you go to Italy and if you go to like a really, you know, just, just a little like family run like Italian restaurant like anywhere, like I used to live in Milan ah! um, for several months and uh, most of the restaurants we went to that was kind of like a mom and pa restaurant, which was kind of most of the restaurants, um, everybody makes their homemade, uh, their own homemade limoncello recipe, which is very cool. So this ah! is what Italians drink, especially Northern Italians, like drink after a meal. So it's wonderful, wonderful by itself. Um, I'm gonna put it into my uh, martini. Instead of using a lemon peel, I'm gonna just use this because it tastes just like a fresh lemon peel, but it's alcoholic. <laughs> So we're gonna pour that in there also. And um, so I put it in my beaker. I'm gonna stir that up. Okay, sorry. Mm, okay. And I'm gonna put my little guy on here. I'm gonna take my martini glass. And there I go. So that's just regular gin uh, with limoncello, and it tastes delicious. Mm. It tastes, yeah, like I said, the, mar the limoncello is just lemon and sugar. Uh, basically, lemon peel soaked in alcohol with sugar added to it. And the refined gin ah! is made from Rhone varietal grapes that have been distilled. Um, and then the botanicals have been added afterwards. Um, sadly, I honestly can't remember what the botanicals are, but they're fantastic, and you should definitely try it if you see it um, on the shelf. Refined Gin from Pasta Robles. All right. Mundus Est Fabula. Um, this may be the largest painting I've ever made. 
So um, let me just kind of do, so that's one end of it. And I'll get out of the way. That's the other end of it. So um, these things here actually stretch out. So the entire thing, when it's totally stretched out on a wall, is uh, nine feet by nine feet uh, tall and wide. So the this is all. Let me see if I can have have a zoom in a little bit. Okay, so this is all of the side of it is crocheted. Um, so crocheted, and then it has there. Um, it has uh, a fake fur in several key places, like there's some fake fur right there too. Because <laughs> uh, what's on the outside is on the inside um, as well, right? So the entire outside is crocheted and um, it's canvas, so I painted this on canvas first and then I crocheted and then sewed the crocheted on and then, thank you. <laughs> So I'll talk about the crystals and the bubbles in a minute. So, um, but that's kind of what this is all about. Well, partially. Uh, and then I crocheted all the way around. And so there's about two feet of crochet around the entire painting. So the painting itself is about like six and a half on one side and seven feet on another. So it's not quite square. Um, and that was an undertaking. Just sewing, sewing something this large was crazy and V is definitely adding her two cents. She was like, I was there. It was nuts. <laughs> and, um, so what is this painting about? Okay. Let me kind of get out of the way. Um, so I painted this painting in grad <gasps> school. I'll just kind of keep, I'll paint. And this was my freshman year. And so this was back in 2009. I started it and I finished it in 2010. So it took me, this painting probably took me eight months. Well, the first part of it took me eight months. And then several years later, I added more to it and then finished it. So really, it probably took me several years to paint because, I mean, it's huge. So I was kind of pissed off because I went to grad school because I was, like, riding high on the visionary art train. I decided I wanted to bring visionary art to the institution. And I was going to change their mind because visionary art is a legitimate art movement ah. that is ignored by art in the art like world with the big A, you know, that like the ivory tower of art supports. Um, visionary art is not included in that ivory tower of art, uh, according to them, of course. I mean, according, according to history, ah. it's bullshit, but current history, it's not. So I wanted to go and I wanted to change the academy, you know, change the institution's ah! mind by legitimizing visionary art sometime, somehow. I wasn't really, I was just young and very passionate with like big ideas. So I got to grad school and man, was I, was I in for a shock. I, I was trying to incorporate visionary art into a contemporary art conversation, which is totally 100% legitimately possible. Um, but at the time, it was very difficult, and um, it was very difficult uh, to say what I needed to say. So part of this painting was like, fuck it, I'm going to paint a bunch of, um, oh, and then I, I was also like pissed at visionary art for a whole other reason, but long story short, I wanted to paint a bunch of um, crystals and bubbles, because I was like, well, that's what visionary art is about, right? Like most of it's just crystals and bubbles, tongue in cheek. Um, and energy lines, right? So it's crystals, bubbles, and energy lines. How can you tell visionary art? Look for crystals, look for bubbles, look for energy lines, look for a goddess, which is often an objectified woman, um, and animals. You can always spot animals and probably sacred geometry. This thing has got it all. So this is definitely visionary art, by the way. So, um... I started this by painting, there are layers and layers and layers, let me zoom in again. Mm. Hi Olivia. Um, hi Chris. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, so I don't know if you can see kind of in the background, there's all of those other lines. Um, so there are Nazca lines painted in there, there's sacred geometry painted in there, you knew it was coming. And there's also 
there is a little like it's called like a sap sucker it's a little bird and it's uh so those squares that are kind of in the background like right over there um it makes absolutely perfect little rectangles like on trees in patterning so i was obsessed with patterning so there's just a bazillion different types of patterning that went in um first thank you um and then on top of that i started painting all of the crystals and the bubbles because of course if it was visionary art it had to have crystals and bubbles so the bird people came in next bird people are something i've been drawing since i literally could hold a pencil and uh my bird people initially had a bird had a human body um, and they all wore dresses and i was like three so really like that's where that's i mean it started that early can you imagine if your kid was just like i'm gonna draw bird people like i don't know why but i did bird people and snakes and like dragons and like i was it started, started young. So those bird people are kind of, they're like, um, I always like to joke that that's kind of what lives inside my head because it's probably true. Uh, let's do a close up on a bird people. Oh, there we go. Um, so those bird people are woke because they've got the third eye, all of them. Where's the other two? There they are. That guy. And then those guys sitting on all of those crystals and those bubbles. Um, so, and then this other character down here um, was taken, I was doing a uh, series of performances called the Hepaglyphic Symbol of Convergence. Before I moved to San Francisco, I had a really intense dream. An angel came to me and said, you are the Hepaglyphic Symbol of Convergence. What does that mean? Ah! The um, HEPA is filter, glyphic is symbol, convergence, of course, is bringing everything together. So I was given this, like, download of that, like, somehow I have to figure out how to make all the symbols talk to each other and transmit it to contemporary culture. No small task, right? So I all of this was, like, in my brain, and I was like, I don't know how. And so I started doing these performance pieces um, where I was kind of like... Ah! doing a jazz dance piece with the area around me. So I was translating the surf. I was translating traffic moving. I was translating a crowd talking and moving around into physical movements that I would interact with. So this figure is one of those um, poses that was captured on film uh, from one of my dance performances. So this, this is a really in-depth painting. That's why we're taking a while and I'm having a martini and so should you. So just as a, as a close up. So she's got her eyes and then this whole thing is happening here. Um, that ground was inspired by my, one of my absolute favorite visionary artists of all time. His name is Maddie Clarwine. Um, Maddie Clarwine is m one of my art heroes. Um, look his work up. It's M-A-T-T-I. K-L-A-R-W-E-I-N. Um, it's, it's beyond, right? And uh, you should definitely check that out. I'll write the, the name in the comments afterwards. So he does a lot of stuff that kind of looks like this. Um, so I was, this painting I was paying homage to um, a lot of my favorites while being very tongue-in-cheek about how I was doing it. So paying homage to... Um, visionary art while still talking about a lot of things that were really important to me. So, um, speaking of art heroes, my other major art hero is, uh, Max Ernst. Uh, Max Ernst was a surrealist and a visionary artist by every stretch of the imagination was incredible. He would do a series of collages or he did do a series of collages that was called Lop Lop du Présenté, which means Lop Lop Presents. Lop Lop was his imaginary bird friend that would come and talk to him in visions. Ah! <laughs> it's amazing. So um, ah! Max Ernst is just, I bow down, like everything that man has ever done is just, uh, you know, beyond as far as I'm concerned. So Mundus Est Fabula, which ah! is the name of this painting, which means the world is a story, is a Max Ernst painting. And the reason that that really not only resonates me because of his art and his message and everything, but um, the world is a story, right? So I was creating this 
piece. I have two other pieces that kind of flank it, and I had a series of other pieces. Um, and many of them are actually sold, uh, which is sad because I had this like big, big idea planned of uh, paintings that were had crocheted frames. So you didn't just hang them on the wall; you kind of splayed them out like they were um, uh, uh, skins. Um, you know, and there's an entire tradition of like native tribes painting uh, ceremonial, ritual, spiritual, religious iconography and steps and. Um, instructions or recipes basically on skins and then putting them out on display as part of the ritual imagery. Um, so that's kind of what I was hearkening to with these, that they are, um, uh, uh, again, a nod to that ritual imagery, a nod to that flaying of the skin, a nod to how those things were displayed. And um, what I thought of them as is uh, thought bubbles. So when you put them on a big wall together, they cut, they lay flat. So this is totally flat on the wall. Um, that's why it has that weird, like you could step into ah! it kind of thing. So like you could just kind of dive in over here and um, everything else would be flat. So each one would kind of be like a thought bubble, like next to each other. And uh, each of these thought bubbles, like I, you know, imagine would be kind of like a stream of consciousness or a, a story that they would they would weave to everybody that would be looking at them because the story I would weave from each of those thoughts and each of those ideas would be ah! totally different than the story that somebody else would look and, and refer to them as. So this was kind of that generation or generative piece where all of those ideas came from. So in one sense, this is kind of the inside of my brain ah! and the rest of reality is out there. <laughs> so welcome to the inside of my head. Um, and another, this is super interesting so that um, being inside one's brain, uh, we have a part of our brain that is the experiencing part and the part of our brain, and I'm pointing at the correct hemispheres, the left hemisphere has a part that tells stories about the experiencing part. So one thing is that we're experiencing everything right now. You're experiencing me talking. I'm experiencing her moving around. I'm experiencing drinking this. Then the second part of it is that as that's ah! happening, that part of my brain is weaving a story about how this is going, what's happening, how you're reacting to it. Um, and so there's the experiencer and then there's the narrator. And the reason this is one of those, like, so, um, like, imagine, like, childbirth, right? It's one of the most painful things a human being can go through. And they go through it voluntarily. Why? Because if anybody actually, like, just based their experiences or based their reality ah! experiences, it would never happen again. No one would ever have a baby because it sucks because it's super painful and all sorts of things can go wrong. It just blows, right? But your narrative part doesn't, like it, it actually only remembers the best part, the worst part, and then the best part again. So it doesn't, it takes like an average of that experience and that's what it remembers. And right after you birth out that kid, all these hormones and all of these endorphins and all this stuff starts flooding your brain. Ah! And like, oh my God, my baby, I love it so much. Right? And then all of a sudden, it's a really positive, amazing experience. So what do we do? You go get knocked up and have another kid. Because you totally forgot how much that sucked the first time. And that's why there's a human race, right? <laughs> because there's this amazing part of our brain that weaves stories about our, all of our experiences. So the world literally is a story. We tell our story to ourselves every moment of every day. But what is so amazing about that is that if we know we're telling ourselves a story, we can tell ourselves a good one, right? Like we don't have to get sucked into kind of a negative loop. I mean, yeah, it's hard. It's hard to get out of negative loops. It's hard to like tell yourself that like things are okay when yeah, sometimes things suck and that's okay. Sometimes things are okay to suck and we get out of it. But you know, if you're stuck in that place, you can start telling yourself the story and eventually you believe it because that is your reality. Our narrator is what creates the world around us. So that's, um, saying that the world is a story and trying to create a painting about it um, was what I set out to do. And not only just this painting, but the series of other paintings and other thought bubbles that all got interwoven. Crochet for me is a symbol of time. 
There's tribes um, throughout the world that keep time and uh, calendars by uh, not making. Um, and uh, that's how I view it because crochet is one long string. It's unbreakable if you don't cut the string. You can continue to crochet indefinitely forever uh, just by looping it. So it's a series of loops that kind of make a knot that you can actually totally unravel if you start pulling the the end of it and it goes back to just a bunch of strings. So there's this beautiful metaphor of crochet and time and history and historicity and memory. Um, so that's why these uh, thought bubbles were always um, uh, uh, framed with crochet and then the crochet kind of interlocks together. Um, so yeah. Uh, so crystals and bubbles. Oh, and most of the crystals and bubbles are kind of formulated to be like cocks and balls. That's not just your imagination. I did that on purpose. Um, bird people. Bird people. I've had bird people. I've literally started drawing bird people since I could hold a pencil. Um, it's pretty ridiculous, but I don't know, man. Bird people are real. We'll talk about bird people another time. I have an entire thing about bird people. Um, because they're real. <laughs> and energy lines and crystals and bubbles all make what? Visionary art. And um, so this was kind of like a tongue in cheek, kind of like I'm just going to make a painting that is visionary art, right? Like, so what does that have? Like, I broke it down kind of to make fun of it, but also to kind of try and like make it a formula. And um, yeah, so. Here, let's zoom in one more time. Mm. Okay. Let's just get one more closer look on all of this stuff. Um, so those are the bird people, crystals and bubbles. This is the center of the painting. Um, and exactly, ooh, yeah, there. Exactly like I said, like all of these, there's kind of a, here, I'm going to flip you around for a second. Huh. Okay. Okay. So basically, this is where the piece starts. It starts in this corner with that uh, toroid shape, and that becomes this woman who is basically like kind of uh, uh, creating awakening, and um, then these energy lines take us around these crystals and bubbles, up and around all of the uh, glyphs, all of the sacred um, geometry, all of the... Um, uh, what are they called? Nazca lines that are back there. Um, and then the bird people kind of usher in uh, that awakening as it comes through back and around, up, up, and then through, out into reality. So this out here is reality, and this in here, we are inside of my brain. <laughs> yes you are okay so that's it the world is a story mundus est fabula thank you so much oh i want to say next week is going to be number 10 i've actually done 10 of these for 10 weeks which is possibly like the longest i've done anything ever um <laughs> i have so many ideas it's hard to commit so i actually committed to this which is amazing so next week is number 10 it's going to be a very special one um so please tune in um i'm going to do a giveaway um, I'll tell you during the week what that giveaway is, um, so please do that. And um, also, I would love it if you go like my artist page. Um, it is artist Christina Lazar, um, and just like it because I post stuff on there too. And um, yay, <laughs> lots of hearts. And thank you so much for joining me. Join me next Sunday for episode number 10 of Booze and Art. Cheers.